In session 23 of this 36 session corporate finance class, I'd like to talk about picking the right financing for your business. In particular, I'm going to argue that the assets you have and their characteristics should determine the right type of debt that you should be taking on as a business. In these last six sessions, we've looked at coming up with the right financing mix for a company and how best to move to that mix. In this very last session on the financing principle, I'd like to look at the other aspect of the financing principle, which is coming up with the right type of debt or right type of financing for your company. Now, lay the groundwork for what we're going to try to do in this session. Let me go back to a very, very simple proposition. Think about the biggest advantage of using debt. It's a tax advantage, right? Interest expenses are tax deductible. Think about the biggest advantage of using equity. It gives you flexibility. Flexibility in what sense? In good times, you can pay out a lot in dividends. In bad times, you don't have to pay any dividends. So here's my definition of a perfect financing. It combines the best features of debt and equity. What I mean by that is I'd like a, a security which gives me the tax benefits of debt while also providing for me the flexibility of equity. And here's why it matters. If you like to take a look at the chart at the bottom of this page, notice that it's the value of a firm that goes up and down over time. So essentially, you can think of it as a cyclical or a commodity company. The value goes up and then it goes down. Then it goes up again and goes down again. And I've given you two contrasting debt issues. In the first one, the value of the debt stays fixed no matter what. And when the value of the debt stays fixed, this company is in trouble every time the value of the business or the value of the assets drops below the value of the debt. And there are at least two places on the graph where it happens. In those scenarios, this company is technically bankrupt. Now, let's say I took the same company and I increased the amount of debt it has, but I made the value of the debt go up and down with the value of the assets. Tough to do, but let's say I could pull it off. If I can do that, this company never goes bankrupt. By making the cash flows on my debt move with the cash flows on my assets, I'm reducing default risk. By reducing default risk, I'm lowering your cost of debt. By lowering your cost of debt, I'm effectively lowering your cost of capital, increasing your value as a business. My biggest sales pitch, matching debt up to assets, is it basically reduces the cost of capital and increases the value of the business. So what I'd like to do is take you through a five-step process for designing the perfect financing for any company. Try this out on a real company because it's not a complicated process. Here's where the process starts. If you want me to design the perfect debt for you as a company, here's what I'm going to need from you. I need some specifics on what kind of investments you face as a company. So let's start to get specific. Here's the first question I would have for you. How long term are your projects? If your projects are extremely long term, then your debt should be really long term as well. An example of a company with really long-term projects would be Boeing. A typical project for Boeing, if you count in the R&D needed to come up with a new type of aircraft, could be 35, 40, or even 50 years. The right kind of debt for Boeing would be 50-year debt. Now, in fact, Boeing was one of two companies in the late 90s that issued 100-year bonds. The other, of course, was Disney. But you can see why Boeing wants to issue really long-term debt. In contrast, if you're Google and you decide to borrow money, a typical project for a technology company might be only two or three years. Your debt should be much more short term. So t tell me something about the duration of your projects, and I'll tell you what the duration of your debt should be. The second question I'm going to ask you is about the currency in which your cash flows come in. It. Give me a pie chart of the currencies in which your cash flows happen. So let's assume that your cash flows take the following form. 30% are in euros, 70% are in dollars. If that is the case, I'd expect your debt to have the same pattern. 70% of your debt should be US dollar debt, 30% should be Euro debt. Sounds simplistic, but very effective. Third, I'm going to ask you how inflation affects your cash flows. What I mean by that is do you have pricing power? If you have pricing power, you can pass inflation through to your customers. You're saying, why do you care? That de determines my choice of whether you're a good candidate to use floating rate debt. Think of how floating rate debt works. The interest rate is set at the start of the debt issue, but each year it gets reset based on what happens to some, some, some preset of market interest rate. It could be the prime rate, it could be LIBOR, it could be the UST bond rate, but every year the interest rate in your debt varies depending on what that rate does. So if that rate goes up, the interest rate in your debt will go up as well. And let me connect that back to whether you have pricing power. Let's say inflation goes up. If inflation goes up, interest rates are almost guaranteed to go up. If interest rates go up, 
and your pricing power, you're going to be okay with that because you can pass the inflation through to your customers and make those interest payments. But if you don't have pricing power, you're going to get squeezed. So if you don't have pricing power and you issue floating rate debt, you're going to find your interest payments being high in exactly the periods when you don't want them to be high. And that is a problem. The fourth question I'm going to ask you is about whether you're a mature company or a growth company, and here's why. If you're a growth company, I think you're a much better candidate for issuing convertible debt, and, here's, and, and the reason is fairly simple. Growth companies tend to have low cash flows, not even because they're not making money, but because much of the money they make has to go back into the company to create future growth. So I'd like you to issue debt where the coupon payments are low up front when your cash flows are low, and that's exactly what convertible debt will do for you. It'll keep the coupon payments low because you've added that conversion option into the debt. And as you mature as a company, the convertible debt will get converted to equity, and hopefully you can replace it with straight debt. That's 80% of debt issues, right? Fixed rate or floating rate, straight or convertible, how long term, what currency? There's a final question I'm going to ask you. Tell me what else affects your cash flows, and I'm going to try to build it into your bonds or debt issues. Let's take a couple of examples. If you're a gold mining company, the biggest driver of your earnings and cash flows every year is what happens to gold prices, right? Wouldn't it be nice if I could get you to issue bonds where the coupon payments are high when gold prices are high and low when gold prices are low? That's essentially what's called a gold link bond, and it's the first of a series of commodity bonds that, have, that was issued by a company called Sunshine Mining in the early 1980s. Today, there's a family of bonds which are linked to different commodities. And if you're a commodity company, you can see the impetus for issuing one of these bonds if you're raising money. Here's a second example. You're an insurance company. You have good earnings, but you're afraid to borrow money because you're afraid that you're one catastrophe, or one disaster away from bankruptcy. An earthquake in, in California, a hurricane in, in Florida. Either could put you under, right? But what if I could issue a bond where your coupon payments and principal were tied to whether such a catastrophe happened? Those are called cat bonds or catastrophe bonds. And there are several billion of those bonds outstanding as well, issued primarily by small insurance companies. What it allows them to do is borrow money. Remember, this is not to get a lower interest rate. You will actually pay a higher interest rate on these commodity linked bonds or on, these, on, the, on the catastrophe bonds. The advantage you get by issuing these bonds is if you did not issue them, you'd have used equity instead. And the cost of debt, even with a higher interest rate you pay on these special bond issues, will be lower than the cost of equity. So that's the first step in bond, bond design, is to start with the business you're trying to finance and then try to match up the debt to the characteristics of that business. Here's your second stop. Make sure you haven't been too clever for your own good. And here's what I mean by that. In the previous step, you were trying to design debt that started to look like equity, right? In fact, you might have done such a good job that the tax guy might look at the security you just designed and say, hey, that looks so much like equity, we're going to treat it as equity. In which case, all your hard work has gone down the drain. So the second step in the process is to make sure or get as close as you can to being sure that the security you've just designed is still going to get you the tax advantages of debt. And at this stage in the process, you might decide to add some special features to the debt or massage it or change a few of the features to maximize your tax benefits. Because the tax law does have its own quirks about how it treats coupon payments and face value and different types of debt. So at this stage in the process, what you're effectively doing is taking your perfect bond that you designed in the first step and making it meet the tax criteria to maximize your tax advantages. So let's say you can pull this off as well. So let's see where we are. You've designed the perfect bond. You've got the tax OK. The third step is a little tricky. If you are a publicly traded company, and especially if you're a regulated publicly traded company, you have three different groups you've got to keep happy. The first are the bond ratings agencies because they're, they're, trying, they're, they're trying to minimize default risk. They're trying to, and in a sense, they want you to issue equity, right? Because when you issue debt, they worry about default risk. The second is equity research analysts who actually want you, to issue, who, who want you to borrow money rather than issue shares because when you issue shares, you create that dilution bogeyman, more shares outstanding. The third is if you're regula regula a regulated company, is the regulatory authorities whose regulatory capital ratios tend to be built around equity. So they want you to issue equity as well. So here's what you'd like to do. You'd like to issue a security that threads the needle. And what I mean by that is it acts like equity with the ratings agency, looks like debt 
to the equity research analyst and goes back to being equity with the regulatory authorities. He's saying, there's no way I can pull that off. No harm trying. And lots of companies do. In fact, many corporate finance departments and investment banks generate a big chunk of their profits from creating securities that are different things to different entities. Let me give you an example. In the early 1990s, investment banks created a security called Trust Preferred Stock. Now, I'm going to describe what Trust Preferred Stock looks like. And you tell me, based on my description, whether you'd put it into the debt bucket or the equity bucket. On Trust Preferred Stock, you have a fixed dividend. It's set up front when you issue the security. That fixed dividend is tax deductible. And if you fail to make that fixed dividend, you have to give up voting shares to the trust preferred stockholders. Fixed payment, tax deductible, loss of control. Hey, that looks a lot like debt to me. But in one of the great coups of all time, the investment bank that created the security managed to get the ratings agencies to initially treat it as equity. Think of the advantage now for you as a company. You can now go out and borrow money effectively by issuing trust preferred. And while you're borrowing money, your rating actually goes up because the ratings agency treats it as equity. It was an immensely profitable security for investment banks. And not surprisingly, there was a lot of pressure on investment bankers to essentially get clients to use the security. So let's say you are low man in the totem pole. It's the early 1990s. And I'm asking you to sell trust preferred to everybody who walks in through the door and you want to do the least damage in the long term from doing this, think about who your best client would be for trust preferred stock. And I'm going to give you two choices. Would it be an under-levered firm that is not borrowing money because it has a rating constraint? Remember we talked that most companies have a rating below which they don't want to drop. Or is it an over-levered firm that already has too much debt but might be able to get away with issuing this trust preferred? Which one do you think is a better company to issue trust preferred without creating long-term damage. I know which one I'd pick. I'd pick the under-levered firm because that's, that rating constraint is artificial anyway. So what that'll allow the under-levered firm to do is use its debt capacity without worrying about, about violating that artificial constraint. The over-levered firm is over-levered because it already has too much debt. Getting it to issue preferred stock, even if you fool the ratings agency, will create a cash flow problem for you. In other words, you've got to make those preferred dividend payments in the future. And the only consolation price I might offer you is you might go bankrupt, but you might go bankrupt with a really good rating. That's not enough of a consolation price. So if you're going to issue trust preferred, be careful, because in a sense, you might fool the ratings agency, but that's not the end of the game. In fact, by the mid-90s, the ratings agencies were starting to treat trust preferred as more debt than equity. So guess what happened? Investment banks came up with more and more complex securities designed, in a sense, to separate companies from their debt more and more. In the process, they created so much separation that there were companies in the late 90s, like Enron, that I would wait if you walked into Enron offices in the late 90s and you asked their CFO, how much money have you borrowed? He would not have known the answer. That's a dangerous place for a company to be. So don't view this as a game. It is true you got to keep equity research analysts, ratings agencies, and regulatory authorities happy. But you have to do it without causing real damage to your company in the process. So you've designed the perfect debt. You've got the tax okay. You've got these different groups reasonably happy. Here's the fourth step. You might have to add some special features to this, to this bond. To sugar, you have to, in a sense, sugarcoat the bond to make it acceptable to bondholders. You're saying, why? Either because you don't have a history in the bond market, you have the wrong kind of history. In other words, you've defaulted in the past. Nobody wants to buy your bonds. So to make them acceptable, to make them buyable, you've got to add some special features, protections for the bondholders. Very early in, this, uh, in these sessions, we talked about puttable bonds, bonds that a bondholder can put back to the company in case it does a leverage buyout or something else that hurts a bondholder. You might add something like that to a bond to make it acceptable to bondholders. In fact, you might add special clauses to these bonds specifically designed to protect bondholders. Remember why you're doing this. You're not doing this because you care about bondholders, but you're afraid that if you don't do this, they will assume the worst about you and charge you a much, much higher interest rate. So let's see where we are. You've designed the perfect debt. You've got the tax okay. You've kept these different groups reasonably happy, and you've sugarcoated the debt just enough to make it acceptable to bondholders. Here's the final step. Make sure you don't lock in market mistakes that work against you. What do I mean? Let's assume that you believe that based on your financials, you should have a single A rating. 
and the ratings agency has given you a double B rating. In other words, they've messed up. If you go out and issue 30-year fixed rate debt today, you're going to lock in an interest rate that's way too high, even if it's the right type of debt for you. My suggestion, use some short-term debt, even though it doesn't match up to your assets, and try to use that time to convince the ratings agency to change its mind. Maybe you'll succeed, and you can issue the 30-year bonds next period. What if you have a market mistake that works in your favor? Now, that creates an entirely different problem, right? So let's say you should be rated double B, and I give you a single A rating. Do you see what you're going to be inclined to do? You're probably going to borrow money you don't need because I'm rating you too highly. I probably, I don't have an issue with that, but my concern is if you go out and borrow the money, you're going to be inclined to try to use that money. And when you have lots of cash sitting around without a use, you tend to do stupid things. So my suggestion to you is, even if you have a market mistake that works in your favor, don't try to take advantage of markets. You got to work with them in the future. So in summary, a five-step process, design the perfect debt, get the tax okay, get the different groups working at least in the same direction, sugarcoat the debt if you need to, and don't lock in market mistakes against you. That's essentially the way you design the perfect debt for a company. Let me try this for Disney. Then in five different businesses, I'm gonna to try to design the perfect debt for each business. Let me start with the movie business. The movie business typically is short-term projects, for Disney, for the most part, these movie projects have been dollars, though an increasing percentage of Disney revenues from movies come from overseas. So if I were designing a, a bond to cover the movie business, I'd probably make it short term for Disney. Probably US dollar for the moment, though I might start to use foreign currency debt if it's an action movie that gets a big chunk of its revenues overseas. But here's one feature you might consider adding to that bond. Movies have a skewed distribution. What I mean by that is there are a few very big winners and lots of losers. So if you could tie the coupon payment on this bond to how well or badly the movie does at the box office, that, that would help you, right? It might not be as useful to Disney as it would be for a company like Lionsgate, which produces only movies. But you can see what we're trying to do. We're trying to design a bond for the movie business and we're trying to match it up to the characteristics of the business. If you're wondering whether anybody would buy this bond, let me remind you of Bowie bonds. If you've never heard of Bowie bonds, David Bowie, rock star of the past, got into a problem with his record company and bought back the rights to all of his music in the early 1990s, which left him with a cash flow problem. So here's what he did. He went to a banker in New York and he issued bonds against his music, against his songs. And what made Bowie bonds unique was the coupon rate on the bond was tied to how well the music did. In other words, if he sold five platinum records, the coupon rate was 15%. If we woke up tomorrow and said, hey, Bo David Bowie's music is terrible, we're not going to buy any of his records, the coupon rate dropped to 0%. If David Bowie can sell Bowie bonds, I don't see why Disney can't sell movie bonds. So what you're trying to do is match up the bonds to the characteristics of the business. The broadcasting business, again for Disney, primarily dollar-driven still primarily short term, so I would probably make it short term and dollar debt. And if I could, I'd like to tie the coupon rate to the ratings on the show, right? Not bond ratings, but Nielsen ratings. Again, I'm trying to design debt that matches up to the characteristics of the assets. The theme park business for Disney is probably the longest term business. That's where I'd expect to see the longest term debt. The currency I'd issue the debt in will depend on the makeup of tourists at each theme park rather than where the theme park is located. So again, designing debt to match up the business. The interactive gaming business is probably Disney's highest growth, riskiest business. If I were issuing convertible debt as Disney, that's the business against which I'd issued against. So if, with each business, what we're trying to do is look at the characteristics of the business and try to design the perfect debt for that business. So let's look overall at Disney. Given what I know about Disney as a company, here's what I'd expect to see as its debt. I'd expect to see debt with a duration of roughly four to five years, matching up to the fact that they have these wide range of businesses and the duration across the businesses is about four to five years. I'd expect to see a, a fair amount of foreign currency debt because 18% of Disney's operations are outside the US and a lot of floating rate debt because Disney strikes me as a company with a lot of pricing power. So I'd expect to see a lot of foreign currency floating rate debt and debt with maturity of between four to five years. Let's see what Disney actually has. If you remember, the maturity for Disney's debt was roughly 7.92 years. 
It turns out to well, probably works out to duration of roughly five to six years. So not too bad. Their debt has roughly the duration I'd expect it to have. However, however, they have relatively little foreign currency debt. It's about 5.4% foreign currency debt, and most of it is in Asian currencies. They have no euro debt. So what I'd expect them to, to do, actually, is have a lot more euro debt, and I don't see that yet. I also don't see very much floating rate debt. I see about 5% floating rate debt. And again, given their pricing power, I'd expect to see a lot more floating rate debt. So my overall conclusions, looking at Disney's current debt, is I would probably prefer it to be a little more short term, a lot more foreign currency, and a lot more floating rate, right? So you're saying, how am I going to fix that? There are a couple of ways you can do it. One is you can, you can use swaps and derivatives right now to fix the problem right away. And essentially what that'll mean is you might swap some of your US dollar fixed rate debt for euro floating rate debt, and your problem will go away. The other, the other way to fix this is Disney has a lot of investments it's planning to make in the next few years. If it funds these investments with disproportionately with foreign currency floating rate debt, its problem is going to go away as well. So either way, Disney can get to a debt that is right for it. And that's pretty much what I would like it to do over time, is move its debt towards the right kind of debt given the asset characteristics that Disney has as a company. So very quickly, let me try this first on my other companies. Let me take Vale and Bookscape first. Okay? Bookscape is a book retailer. It's a single bookstore in New York City. In fact, the debt that it has right now, which is a lease on the bookstore, strikes me as the perfect debt for Bookscape. So Bookscape, I'm okay with their existing debt because it matches what I'd expected to see. Vale's typical investment is in a new mine. These mines have really long-term lives. The earnings of cash flows in the mine are linked to commodity prices. If I were designing debt from scratch for Vale, I'd make it really long-term debt and tie the coupon rate on the debt, if possible, to the commodity in question. So if it's an iron ore mine, I'd like to tie the coupon rate to the, to the price of iron ore. So Vale and Bookscape were relatively simple. With Tata Motors, a typical investment is probably a new assembly plant, either in India for producing Tata Motors cars in India or in some other part of the world for Land Rover Jaguar. So I would expect the debt to be relatively long-term because these are long-term investments. What currency I use will depend upon whether I'm looking at a Tata Motors auto plant or a Land Rover auto plant. And Land Rover, I think, has pricing power. So if, that's, if, if the debt I'm issuing is for a Land Rover pricing plant, I'd be more inclined to use floating rate debt. Baidu is a high growth company. I would make the growth work in my favor. And with Baidu, my, my suggestion would be to try to use convertible debt. And the reason their growth is going to work in their favor is the growth option will actually, the conversion option, will actually become more valuable with high growth and high risk. So in a sense, with every one of these businesses, I'm trying to match up the debt to their assets. Incidentally, Neither Tata Motors nor Baidu has debt right now that matches up to what I'd expect them to have. And that's not surprising. Many emerging market companies right now have mismatched debt. Part of it reflects their history. 10 or 20 years ago, these companies had no choice but to more borrow money from the bank, and the bank set the terms. And if the bank said, we lend you only three of fixed rate debt, that's what you had on your balance sheet. I think the opportunities for these companies to fix those mismatches are much greater because they have access to capital markets and they can now issue bonds. So with all of these companies, my end game is I want to see debt issues that match up very, as closely as I can to the characteristics of the cash flows of the assets that they have as companies. So here's what I'd like you to try. Take a company, take a company you're familiar with and see if you can design debt for that company. Think about it, whether you want the debt to be short term or long term, what currency you want the debt to be, whether it should be fixed rate or floating rate, whether it should be straight or convertible. If you want to be creative, think about what other features you'd like to add to this debt, given what you know about the company. Once you do that, you're going to discover that designing the perfect debt is not that complicated. This really is not rocket science. Thank you very much for listening.